welcome. Uh, this is a, the first, we hope to be many, uh, joint activities between my company, Lean Law, and Maddie Martin's company, Smith AI. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Today's focus is law firm profitability through strategic outsourcing. And I wanted to start, I'm going to kind of steward the conversation in the beginning and Maddie and I will go back and forth, but I, I always like to start before we get into who we are and all the whys is, you know, what are we doing here today and why? And, and, you know, the focus is developing a lean practice. And you'll see this author, his name is Simon Sinek, and he greatly influenced me in my thinking. Um, he, there's a YouTube video out on his, what he calls the golden triangle. It's this little circle. And it, his concept is start with why. And I like to just kind of use this as a starting place to say, well, let's go through this exercise so we have context as to why we're here and, and, and what we hope to get out of it. So why is... Why would you ever want a lean practice, right? Why, what's the reason, what's the motivation? Is it, you know, and, and this is for you to decide, but is it profitability, just profitability? Is it lifestyle? Um, is it focus, meaning you can have more focus in servicing your clients? Um, or is it maybe a derivative of reducing stress? But it's important to understand the why as a function of your motivation. And, and sometimes when you have, don't have the why, you lose context. How is the next step, which is how do you go about doing it? And, and the how here is a developing this lean practice mindset. And only the what part are the tactics. And what we find is sometimes we focus on the tactics without really understanding the why, and we fall short. But success comes when we actually understand our motivation for doing something the how we're going to go about doing it, and then only getting to the what. So that's that focus, and I wanted to lay that out. And Maddie, this is interactive, so you should jump in and, and speak. Um, don't feel like this is my thing. So um, No, I think you encapsulated it perfectly. All right, so here's the two of us. Maddie, why don't you introduce yourself to the group? So I'm Maddie Martin. I'm the head of growth and education for Smith AI, and we are a virtual receptionist service for live calls and web chat. We also have a cloud phone system called Keypad. We've been around since 2015, and uh, we have worked with um, hundreds of businesses, primarily solo and small firm attorneys, and in helping them be more responsive, reduce interruptions, and run a more productive, profitable, and professional business. Um, I'm Jonathan Fishman. I'm a founder and chief services officer for Lean Law. We are a timekeeping and billing software tool uh, with the industry's deepest integration to QuickBooks Online. And our aim in life is to modernize your invoicing workflow, to create efficiencies, and to help you get your time into a system, get it billed, get it to a client, and to collect those funds. Um, so let's move forward. First poll, starting with a poll, first thing. Um, first poll is, my polls are screwed up. How large is your firm? I, we're gonna skip that poll because I somehow you can just messed that up. Mm -hmm. I somehow messed that, so it'd be great if you could text us. I apologize, my first goof. Um, my poll didn't work right, but I just well, we want to get a sense of who's on the call, how big your firm is. If you could text us that, that would let us know because it'll help us um, kind of speak to specifically to some of the different types of, uh, of firms. So what we mean by solo plus is these are the different types. So I can see we're getting some micro firms, a solo plus, um, a solo. So thank you for, for speaking to that, everyone. Um, let's go to the next slide. So. Here's the, the main premise or thesis. Uh, it's a concept that we came to be here with my CEO, Garen and Alan and I were on a whiteboard drawing and we said, lawyers are stuck in this overhead swamp. And one thing to keep in mind, our CEO, Gary Allen, is a 35 year practicing attorney. So he understands the, the livelihood, the world of attorneys um, firsthand. And when you look at this, you basically have this idea that a lean practice is as a percentage of income, 20%. So anything under, any overhead under, 20% and under is deemed lean. 20 to 40% on the left axis is, can be not bad, can be pretty good. 
And as you start to go south of 40%, you get into what you call this, this more red orange zone. And we call it this overhead swamp because overhead in our fundamental belief is this idea that kind of holds you back. It's this thing that you're constantly trying to feed. And so when you ask yourself, how do you address overhead? How do you work to overcome it? There's really only two directions, right? You can go both ways. You can be more productive. You know, you can increase your revenue and revenue goes up. And if the overhead stays the same, your expenses, then your percentage of overhead decreases or you can go lean. And Manny and I had a really interactive and fun discussion about this in that one feeds the other. And the idea is that as you go lean and you outsource and you do these tactics, it actually puts you in a position to be more productive um, and potentially increase that revenue. But when you think of your own practice, you really have to think at the context of, you know, if I reduce overhead, how do I go about doing that? If I become more productive, how do I go about doing that? But the, the, the net of what we're trying to get at is that this overhead swamp is holding you back. It's holding back your firm and it has negative consequences. Um, so what we want to ask the crowd, I, I, I know I have this one. <laughs> um, what overhead, now you think about yours, I'm going to launch this poll and We'll do it for about 30 seconds, but what is your overhead? What, you know, based on that, and this is all anonymous, we won't know the answers, so feel free to be honest, but what it, wow, awesome, we got some less than 20% people, that's great. We'll get the poll open for another 10 seconds to make sure everyone's had a chance to, to interact with the poll. Okay, so, the majority of you are sitting in the 20 to 40 percent. Um, there are a few of you in the less than 20 percent, and there's a few of you in the 40 to 60 percent. So, you know, the more, majority are in that kind of middle range, but um, there are some people in there. So, let's talk a little bit about Maddie. We, I want you to talk a little bit about this concept of the. Um, are you lowering or are you laboring and what that really means in terms of stats and she's going to just kind of cue me up when I'm, she wants to move through slides. So be prepared for that. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jonathan. So what we find in the 2017 and 2018 Clio legal trends reports is that if you do have, you know, a lot of overhead and also a burden of work in especially these solo and small and micro practices, it's really actually affecting your billable output and your revenue generating opportunities, as well as you know, work-life satisfaction um, and possibly even the amount of that revenue that you're capturing in terms of funds actually brought in and not just earned and possible to bring in. So what we find from these reports is that just under two hours a day is the average attorney's amount of time spent on billable work, and it's actually less than the time spent on administrative tasks, which are mostly comprised of office administration, invoicing, and configuring technology. And we know, though, that a big majority, uh, not a majority, a big portion of the time uh, that's not spent on billable work or admin is also towards business development. So there is the objective and there is the prioritization of doing activities that lead to business growth because of the amount of time that we're seeing spent there. So you can move to the next slide, Jonathan. Now, we know also that interruptions not only have a time cost associated with them for the interruption itself, but also the recovery time from the interruption. So when we're thinking about doing administrative tasks or switching gears because you're wearing so many hats in a solo or small firm practice, and maybe you answer the phone and it's a potential client, maybe you answer the phone and it's a judge, or it's a spam call, you know, many folks who are in solo and small practices don't know until they pick up the phone. The problem is, is every interaction um, ends up having a kind of refractory period where you're recovering and then getting back to the task at hand, which is another loss of time. So we find that not only is it the case that responsiveness matters, so that's why you're picking up the phone, um, two out of three potential clients say that their decision to hire an attorney is based on 
that attorney's initial responsiveness to their first call or email. I would even include web chat in that now um, and possibly depending on your demographic of your clients, if it's a lot of millennials, even text messaging. But the problem is that even given that responsiveness, 59% of people on average say they um, are not hiring an attorney even after a consultation. So not only do we see an importance of responsiveness, but we see an importance of very effective and systematic filtering to make sure that people who are scheduling consultations are qualified um, clients who you want to work with. Now, at the same time, kind of bring it back to the, you know, billing practices that Jonathan uh, will speak to, 86% is the amount of an attorney's earnings that is ever collected. So there's a lot of money that gets left on the table. Given the, you know, less than two hours you're spending on billable work per day, it's really important that that money is actually captured and in your bank account. So we'll talk about some ways to get more out of the the time and effort um, and earning potential that you have to reap you know 95 99 percent of the total revenue that is due to you you can go to the next slide so the thing that i want to emphasize here and this is just another case for financial planners it's the case for accountants it's the case for people who are running it firms any small service driven business you are not alone as an attorney because this is happening systemically across all service-driven small businesses. And this is just one example from a Kitsis study where basically we're seeing that a lot of people are spending time meeting with prospects, um, planning those meetings, administrative tasks. It's, it's not necessarily the case when you're in a small practice that you have as much time as maybe you initially thought you would um, to focus on actually completing work that is your specialty. So there's a lot of opportunity costs going on here in terms of time that could be spent generating revenue versus time that could be spent on administrative or you know, lead qualification tasks, et cetera. So what we see, uh, you can move to the next slide, is that there are a number of dilemmas that this data presents. And the first is that we have this dilemma between um, being responsive to interruptions and reducing them because they hurt productivity. So even though potential clients demand a quick response time, um, the, the quick response and picking up the phone actually really hampers productivity and can you know, hamper your ability to meet deadlines um, or even to be productive on certain things that are long-term growth oriented, like, you know, writing articles or networking, um, whatever the case may be. So for the second dilemma, Jonathan, you can move to the next slide. Um, it's really, you know, capturing as much of the revenue as possible. So invoicing and chasing down late payments, obviously that takes up a lot of time. We've seen categorically through the Clio Trends reports that that is a systemic issue. So you wanna minimize these time consuming billing tasks so that at the same time, um, you, you need and deserve to get paid and not after you know, a collections agency takes a huge cut. So how do we maximize revenue? Well, one of the things we'll discuss is having you know, credit card payments enabled for your firm. Um, we see by far that the you know, two, 3% um, of fees is well worth getting from 85% you know, to 95% of revenue capture, not to mention the fact that in terms of reducing your burden and your follow-up, um, when you have a credit card payment, the, the onus of non-payment is on the bank, not on you. So the, the, the money comes to you, and then if the person doesn't pay their credit card bill that month, that's between the credit card company and that person, rather than a bounce check, a late payment and non-payment um, directly through cash, which then is up to you to hunt down and reconcile. So moving to the third dilemma, um, this really has to do with technology and you will hear um, Jonathan and me talk about this throughout the course today, but we know that in solo and small firm practices, it's extremely important to gain as much efficiency as possible through the use of technology and also outsource services because there is 
not someone who's sitting next to you who is an IT specialist. There is not someone who um, you don't have, you know, support staff for days. What we find is that resources are very limited um, and the bandwidth to implement technology is limited. So yes, technology is critically important to gain efficiency uh, in these solo and small firms and compete with the bigger firms in the market, but also they need to be easy and affordable software that you can basically implement on your own without handholding or need from you know tech support. Now the fourth dilemma is around control. Often what I hear and I travel around the country at different events particularly focused on solo and small firm attorneys and I was just at the Louisiana solo conference in New Orleans and uh, I heard this yet again, that people who are in solo, small micro practices, part of the, the motivation to do so is to have control. Now, when we talk about the overhead swamp, what that means is less and less control and more and more behavior that is just trying to keep above water and to keep ahead of that um, heavy expense ratio that you have every month based on the revenue. So not only does it have to do with revenue though in terms of control, it also has to do with setting up your practice so that it is growing or sustained at the level where you see your ideal work-life balance. So as we think today about the overhead swamp, we also want to think about in terms of your goal setting, in terms of your productivity, your work-life balance, Jonathan and I are not prescribing a certain amount of hours that we think you should work a week. Like that is completely up to you, but balancing work and life means setting out your goals and then identifying ways to achieve them and, and setting up certain systems and software so that you have the flexibility to move towards those goals and that you are not paying for something now that you need to keep working at a certain level to sustain the cost of if you're looking to have more work-life balance or if you're looking to you know bring on a partner if you're looking to um, you know bring in more revenue then maybe your expense ratio is different but keeping this in mind as we go through the discussion today now, the, what this means and what you can do, next slide, Jonathan, please, um, is we're going to talk about cost-effective systems for handling all of that inbound communication and uh, demand on your time that can feel like it's inundating and, and overwhelming you and also wasting the precious time that you have in these solo practices. So how can you hand off certain tasks? How can you lean out certain processes and systematize things so that you're not doing things on such a manual basis and through automation and outsourcing and affordable software, let's say, you're able to focus more on the task at hand that generates revenue, so increasing the bottom line, and then spend less time on things that um, consume time that's not revenue generating. Next slide. So the qualities we're gonna be looking at today are systems that are affordable. So keeping in mind also that that requires a lack of commitment. So when we're looking at software and services, are they tying you into year or multi-year contracts? Um, ideally not. Ideally, it's more month to month and flexible so that you have, again, more control. They should be customizable and easily so, so that you don't have to hire someone to help you customize these systems. Um, and then comprehensive. So the fewer bills that you have, the better. For example, if our receptionists are uh, handling your calls in addition to your web chats, not only do you have consistent messaging across those two channels, which is important, um, but you have one bill to review at the end of the day. So it's important that like you protect your time and, and look for every opportunity to do so, even if it's about like reviewing bills that takes multiple time because they're from a million different companies. And then these should integrate with the processes and systems that you have. So if there is a calendar that you hold, 
do you have the ability for your front office staff or your receptionist staff or your paralegal to schedule appointments on that and then it updates your calendar instantly if you have a receptionist service that is handling calls for you is it immediately putting new contact information into your crm if you have an invoice that's paid is it automatically updated in your billing system so reducing again the manual tasks and the nice thing is in this day and age a lot of this technology is extremely easy to use and affordable um, so that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Jonathan? Yeah, I'm going to add one little note because part of my background is IT services, working with small businesses, it's something I did before I got to Linlon. And, and when you think about this, well, you may have an end goal that's very broad and big. You can chunk pieces off. So, you know, with Smith AI, you can pick up lots of different pieces to the puzzle, but then you might go and do a different one. So the idea is that you want to have the decision and the goal that says, I want to actually move forward and, and move on this, but you also don't have to feel like you've got to do everything at once. I see sometimes people get in this like first of the year. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you see this, Maddie, like people get, you know, January 1st, I'm going to go on a diet. I'm going to work out. I'm going to yeah. just do all this stuff. It's going to be great. And by January 18th, it's, it's hard. And we know that, really it takes it's a marathon and not a sprint and you really need to be fairly calculated as to how you go about it and and how you pick those um pick the first task the first yeah. thing you do. I'll say, I'll say one thing about that, you know, like it's really easy to, to go on a diet or to eat more broccoli or to cut out uh, sugar soda or something. But I think for a lot of folks, it can be very hard to adopt new processes because there's analysis paralysis that happens. And, and there's this sort of like um, perfectionism that I, I absolutely relate to that's like, I'm going to do all this research. And then that research itself becomes the burden. And what the nice thing is right now with whether it's software or services, there are a lot of free trials out there. So what I would recommend is don't get bogged down by like, how am I going to import all my data? How am I going to adopt this? And you know, flush out this entire new process that my entire team is going to adopt, or I'm going to need to change my processes. Like what we recommend is that when you're looking at like adopting a new process or system or service, you do the free trial and you just see like, do you like using it? Are you going into that system? Are you, you know, if you forward your call to us, for example, like, is it being handled properly? And do you kind of like that initial experience to like, not just dip your toe in, but to dive in? The only way to know is to get started. And normally the risk is pretty low for, for that initial kind of trial period. So yeah. it's- Yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, it's just, it's, um, I would say like, I hear very often, I want to do this and I'll do it in the future or we need to, you know, have a big powwow if this is something we're going to move to or I have, for example, maybe I have a, a different billing system or I have a front office staff. Like what I always say is, well, that person has other tasks that sometimes they just don't need to be interrupted or they're out for a sick day or they run other errands or like many solo and small firm attorneys like i feel you you are repurposing people like a paralegal to answer the phone and you know you're paying too much for someone to answer the phone and you hired a paralegal to be a paralegal so so overflow whether it's like on software or service side can be a really easy way to get started with a service like ours where you know like I don't need to have everything figured out for every type of call under the sun. And I don't even need to have the burden of the cost of that, nor do I need to shift my staff because I really like this person who has worked with me and I'm loyal to them, but they're human and they get sick. They have other tasks that are required of them. So how do you, how do you run a business that is even more responsive and also protect those jobs and the systems that you have in place? What I'm saying is, that actually doesn't need to be as reconciled as a lot of people may think. Um, okay, let's move forward. And let's just talk about the next part of this conversation is, you know, Maddie and I, we're going to talk about sort of what a lean firm is, you know, where that money's going, and, and a little bit about your role in stewarding this process. So, you know, the traditional firm, um, you're kind of looking at three quarters admin um, per uh, attorney. Um, so you're looking at, you know, 35 to 55% of overhead. Um, and as we kind of described in the overhead swamp, a lean law firm is really 
you know, one staff to multiple attorneys and you're looking at two to 4,000 per month. Now that two to 4,000 is, is all derivative on what part of the country you're in and you know, what your rent is and other things like that. So it's not an absolute, but you get this idea that, you know, your target is this 20% number. That's, that's the most ideal number. Now, if you, if you have, you know, that you can have a, a bigger earner and that number might not be there. So the way out, Lean practice is the way out. It's the direction. It moves you to this place. And I don't, I want to be, keep reinforcing this point is that a lean practice is a nimble practice that gives you the opportunity to have choice. Whether that choice is to go earn more clients, to serve my clients better, to serve my community, to be more in my family, whatever that choice is, that's your choice. When you have the big overhead, and I see this, all I do all day long is talk to accountants and lawyers. And I see these lawyers in particular that are like on this hamster wheel of overhead. And every month it's about what billable hours we do. Um, what's my, you know, whip, my work in progress in a given month, because they're basically in their head running their, you know, profit loss for the particular month. So lean practice is a way forward. Um, where does that cost go? It's really personnel. I mean, yes, rent and sort of a derivative overhead. But when you think about salary, tax, benefits and then the derivative of costs of computers rent energy internet all these other things staff is what's driving your overhead um, and that's what to maddie's point about you know thinking about how you can smartly outsource how you can not have your paralegal be answering the phone and be doing things that are more income focused it's all comes down to you thinking about staffing really fundamentally i mean there are workflows with tools and outsourcing and, and things of that nature but it, it's it's about staff so as we mentioned law firms uh lean firms equal more profitable firms lower overhead better lifestyle more flexible um, more resources and and more com it's more competitive for your talent so you know this is the benefit of moving into that environment um, but it also means, and I want to be clear and say this again, it means that you potentially can think about more value-based pricing, right? I mean, the holy grail in the law industry is to try to rise out of the billable hour and move into this value-based pricing that creates consistencies on income and, and cash flow. Um, you can create deeper relationships with the clients and have better services. Potentially with a lean firm, you could do more pro bono, pro bono work. But at the end of the day, you know, what we see in our lean attorneys at Lean Law, and again, we're interacting with these folks on a daily basis, are happier lawyers. And, and that ultimately creates a happier client. Um, so Maddie said this in our conversations leading up to this, and I think it's really a truism of the lean firm model. Um, and I'll let Maddie, you speak to this because this was your note that you put in. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when we're thinking about how we determine what you're basing your lean firm model on, I think it would be very easy to say, I'm going to take the average of the last 12 months or even the last 24 months. I'm really familiar with like, you know, the, the, the overall average. The problem that we know with averages is that they really hide a lot of the fluctuations. Um, so it can be very skewed. What we recommend is that you take your lowest monthly revenue and take a very conservative approach based on the minimum revenue you can expect and then put your model on that as your baseline. Yeah. Okay. So kind of summarizing this section. So the idea is, and I'm, I really want to reinforce this, understand your why. And um, we went back in that beginning and, you know, why, uh, if you have a good sense of what your why is and what you do, the what you do and how you go about doing it becomes much easier. Many times we jump to, well, let's just go do it. And you don't really understand your motivation for doing it and you fall short. Um, the concept, and, and, and Maddie summarized it really, really well in saying, hey, there's this dollar amount that you're earning at your lowest number, and you may earn more in the future, absolutely, but let's start there, and then work backwards from that moment and say, what's my overhead? And really look at that labor cost, right? That's the, that's the, the, the key piece there, um, because labor is where 
you're spending the majority of your money and it has a derivative effect on ancillary costs. And then of course the mindset, which is really about committing to it. You know, it's the marathon, it's not the sprint. I would also just say one thing here is that the business fundamentals have changed dramatically in terms of a uh, lawyer's expectations of their own firm and the client's expectations. So in the past, you know, we were seeing like that really a, a virtual law practice was blasphemy. And now that is becoming more and more adopted. More and more consultations are on the phone or video chat, less so in person. And what does that mean? It means that not only are you more accessible for a consultation, it's easier to schedule, but it also consumes less of your time time because you are not necessarily doing like the whole meet and greet and get the coffee, get the water, sit down, say goodbye. Like a phone call is much more succinct. Um, and then also there's a greater tolerance for kind of adoption of technology in the, in the practice of law as well. So keep in mind that like the business fundamentals that you see and that you're there you're using one way to approach like the lean model is to say like with my existing systems like this is how i can uh streamline it and and another way also is to say like these are some things that i could adopt that change my fundamentals my baseline and then i'm gonna be lean off of that yeah and the other little note there is that it's also becoming you know as you become a lean law firm and you adopt two technologies and much of it is virtualized in the cloud the resources that service you don't necessarily have to be in your local town, in your office, right? So you can find paralegals and other legal assistants in many, a myriad of different places and bring those skill sets into your practice and use them in a just-in-time basis and not have to say, house them. So it really changes the, the, the complexity of what you can offer to your clients because you have greater resources at your site. So let's talk about getting into the right mindset. Um, so I have a... I have a concept here and, you know, this is, Matt, was like, huh, what does this mean? You know, lean practice equals really what it means and what we're trying to get here in this, this, this slide is to say, listen, you got to start with a goal and the goal might be, I want to do X or Y. I want to reduce my overhead from X to Y over a certain period of time. Like you just need a goal. You need something to measure a measuring stick to put in the sand so you can say, I did that, right? So that's the first thing. You gotta have that as a foundation. And then technology is going to be a component of it, right? We're gonna put some technologies or some other services in place, but there's also this idea of behavior, like this concept that I'm gonna outsource something. I'm gonna take something that I was doing myself or had some staff person doing, I'm gonna ask someone else to do it. And because that, I'm gonna have to kind of change Something, I might not answer my phone live, right? I might have someone like Maddie service answer the phone on my behalf. That's a behavior change. So if you just put technology in and you don't have a goal and you don't change your behavior, you'll fail, right? And you could change your behavior, but if you don't have the right tools and you don't know where you're going, you could fail again. So there's this synthesis of these three tenets that really derive success here, but it starts with this goal. I want to go from X to Y over this period of time. I mean, that's one example of a goal. But the, that's how we get there. If you set that in stone, then you can back it out and say, okay, what do I need to do? What, well, how am I going to chunk this out? So that's what that concept is, is that these three pieces work together. Um, accountability. So it starts with you, right? You've got to start this process. If you're in this micro firm, as some of you are, you've got to be the catalyst and evangelist for your partners. If you're a solo, then you've got to kind of walk the walk. If you're a solo plus, you got to ask your question, what is the plus doing for you? And how are they doing that for you? Um, you also need to have oversight, which is a component of your accountability, right? You, you can't just give it to someone and say, you got it. You've got to make sure that there is some oversight and that there's some checks and balances in place. And I've seen this a lot in the accounting side where things go completely awry because no one was on a bi-monthly basis looking at the books and some bookkeeper was off doing some things in a very, you know, how do I say it? Not so perfect way. Um, if you're in a team as some of you are in this micro firms, it's really important to make it a buy, uh, to get buy-in from the entire team and make it an effort of the, of the firm. And, and that seeps into the culture of the firm. I get this all the time 
with people adopting lien law is that there's a partner that won't, you know, that's just did it the certain way, it's always done a certain way, or there's a there's a there's someone who's in charge of bookkeeping that's sitting and wants to do it the way they've been doing it for the last 10 years. And what happens is that that's affecting the overall culture of the firm is that we're not progressing, we're not moving forward. And we have to make sure that everyone has buy-in, um, in, in, in particular, all the stakeholders. And we gotta make sure this is a two-way conversation. So you may say, hey, we're gonna do this, you know, X and Y by a certain date, but you also need to be able to receive feedback from the team saying, hey, here's some concerns I have, or here's some, you know, here's what I've learned as we've gone through that process. Um, so it's a two-way conversation with your team. But I will say that as you move forward and evolve in this, it really permeates into the culture of the firm and it helps when you're recruiting new people into it because they get really excited that you're working efficiently and modernly. I think the other thing that I'll mention there, Jonathan, is that like if you tell the team that and you and you demonstrate that buy-in has results for them yeah. and that you take what they're saying seriously and they see certain things being implemented, it has this extra benefit of them having their eye out proactively for improving things that maybe are not in your radar, um, not on your radar or in your purview immediately every day as much as it is to them. And they bring things proactively to you because they know that you respect their voice and their opinion. And that can present opportunities for growth and leaning out that, that maybe you didn't even think of. Yeah, you're totally right, because you've got to remember there's sort of, I use this word called workflows, which just means there are steps in a process, right? There are workflows. There's a start, a middle, and an end. Right. And what happens is there's all these mini micro workflows that are part of a big one, and many times your staff or someone even working outside the organization is responsible for this micro workflow, and that's where you see some real optimization and efficiency because someone's in the weeds saying, hey, I do these 17 things, and I think if we got this tool, it would automate it for me. Um, so, you know, we're talking a lot about outsourcing, but there is this piece that you have to do some of the work, right? Historically, we ran these law firms like, you know, that the lawyer would just do nothing. And one example is timekeeping, right? The idea that I'm going to track my time, hand it to an administrative person who's going to enter in a time system, and I'm going to replicate that task twice. That's just stupid. I, I don't mean to be so crass about that, but it's an entire, entirely inefficient system. I mean, Lean Law has four different ways of, of tracking time based on your needs. There's no reason any person who's working in a modern day can't either voice translate their, their time with Dragon or some other tool or type it in directly. So you've got to take some ownership of the process. All right, we have a poll. Stop. We have a poll. And I have this poll queued up. So um, we're asking now, do you have experience outsourcing? Have you done it? So this is a check all that apply one. And so you should have your polls and we're gonna get you voting. All right, I can see some votes coming in. And we've got another 10 seconds or so. Okay. So um, the majority is accounting and bookkeeping. Um, you know, good chunky said you've never outsourced any of the services, paralegals and some lead screening and um, intake services. So it seems like everyone has some familiarity with outsourcing. So the next and last part of the, the next half of the conversation is all gonna get specific into, um, you know, specific into Workflows, and I'm going to take the first part of this and talk about how um, and why and what benefit you get for outsourcing your accounting and bookkeeping. Um, and I really want to talk about what advantages you have there. So I'm going to go through that part. Then Matt is going to get in and talk a little bit about um, some of the other services that AI uh, does or that Smith AI does, um, and and speak to those in a more specificity. So. In talking about outsourcing bookkeeping and accounting needs, um, we see two scenarios, right? There's, we see scenarios where you, the attorney, are doing your own bookkeeping um, and accounting. And, and when I mean, you know, accounting, I really mean the function of reconciliation on a monthly basis and interacting with QuickBooks. Um, and we see someone inside the firm doing it as a 
job of a bunch of other functions. So they're not really a bookkeeper. They're really not thinking about the what's happening and what's innovating in the online accounting community. Um, and they're doing it inside the firm. So we're going to talk about what opportunities there are in, in changing that. So a little bit on lean law, um, just to toot our horn a bit. So we're in online accounting and invoicing system. Um, the reason I bring up lean law is that part of the process here is that you need to adopt a really good invoicing tool, right? That's that tool that's going to help you track the time, draft that into a draft invoice, deliver it out to the client, and help you get collected, right? There's that workflow through that and the modernization of that. And that's what Lean Law does. Now, our, our sort of place in the world is that we have the best integration with QuickBooks Online. So we made a decision early on when we started with Lean Law is that QuickBooks was a viable and sound accounting solution for lawyers, but it lacked certain and explicit functionality that lawyers needed. And what problem we're trying to solve is this idea of a hybrid ledger or a general ledger, which means your accounting data is in one tool, like you know some, some tool, and then your, I'm sorry, your billing data, your accounts receivable data is in one tool, and your actual accounting data is another, and they're not talking to each other. And that pain point might be on your invoicing AR side, that pain point might be on your trust accounting side, which you might be doing it in like in an Excel sheet, which we see a lot, which doesn't then equate to your balance sheet. Or it might be on your reporting, that you're cobbling together pieces of things to get decent reporting. So by having a QuickBooks online accounting architecture in place, what that does is it opens up an army of QuickBooks Pro professionals that are available to be outsourced. That's number one. Number two, because it's online, it's readily accessible. There's no like, hey, you got to get on my machine to do the bookkeeping. So when we think about the world of cloud legal management, it's, it's messy. So there's practice management on the left-hand side, which is all these tools that have a function of invoicing. And then there's invoicing and only tools. And the reason I put the slide up is I want to pay very close attention to three products on the right side, Time Slips, Tabs 3, and PC Law. All three of those are, a, are very old, antiquated systems. And what we're seeing a lot in Lean Law is people shedding off of that, wanting to modernize, wanting to be more efficient, and bringing into a Lean Law QuickBooks Online environment. So when you think about engaging an outside bookkeeping or accounting pro, and, and a, a word on that. It does not need to be a CPA. A CPA, in many instances, thinks tax first. So she's just thinking, how do I set this up to mitigate and to facilitate, mitigate tax and to facilitate your tax returns? An accounting pro, we call it accounting pros in lean law, but a bookkeeping or an accounting pro really is, is the worker bee. They're thinking about the life cycle of your money through all of the accounting and all of the tools that need to be put in place and tasked to manage it. So when you think about what you're engaging, the core services, and I use the word commodity here because in this day and age, it is a fairly commoditized service, is accounts payable, monthly reconciliation, monthly financial and time keeper reports, payroll, um, these repeatable financial workflows. It's the monthly tasking. And that's a commodity, and it's not difficult. It's not very difficult to find it. Now, the value add, and what you're looking for when you think about a law firm is AR. Can they come in and say, "I'll take your AR for you all the way through receivable, so you're not collecting, right?" They can take it from draft invoice all the way to client, or they can pick it up just on the collection side, meaning when you get paid. So they've seen different instances of that. Compensation reports, so in the micro law firm, compensation and being transparent and reporting on that can sometimes be complex and it's really critical. You can call on them to actually generate those reports on your behalf. Bi-monthly reports related to WIP, work in progress, receivables, and other key metrics like WIP to trust. Can they be your partner in helping you quantify where you are at a given moment so you don't have to think about it. You get a report and they can highlight, and I'm gonna show something like that in just a moment. Really critical to lawyers, three-way trust reconciliation should be done on a monthly basis, right? Making sure that 
not only did you, you know, get the right trust money, but did it get into the right client ledgers? Are we making sure that we're accounting for the money accurately? And last is the state bar compliance. Can they help you be compliant? So those are some of the things that you should be thinking about when you engage an accounting pro. So I talked about that invoicing workflow. And the reason I bring this slide up is this is actually something from within lean law. And what I want you to pay attention to is that approved button right in the middle. What that is is a function that allows you to essentially put your time in, review a draft electronically, and then be able to approve it to a uh, accounting person who can then take it to uh, collections for you. Um, looking at real-time reports, as I talked about that bi-monthly, and I highlight this, this is a trust to WIP number. I've got 4,000 in trust and $5,000 in, in WIP, work in progress. That's problematic. Or maybe I just got a payment that I want to notify you. But the idea is that this is a live lien law report that takes what's happening in QuickBooks and what's happening in lien law and puts it into one report. And that accounting pro could deliver that to you and highlight the areas that are of concern to you. So IELTS of trust accounting, the idea that they can help you make sure that your trust accounts are reconciled and organized the way. This is an actual screenshot from in lien law relative to the trust accounting. So from your vantage point, what we advise you to look at is four critical components. You know, your practice and your firm from a compensation level. Your subordinates and timekeepers, are they being productive? Your clients, are they good clients? And what I mean by good clients are not just you know, there's a subjective aspect. Are they good clients? Do you like working with them? Do you like the type of law? But I think the clients that they're profitable, do they pay their bills? You know, are they repeatable? Are they good clients from a financial standpoint? And lastly, of course, your compliance. So when, how do we find these people, right? Where do we find these people who can help me? So there's something called a certified pro advisor. Um, in QuickBooks, which means these people have gone through classes and been certified by QuickBooks, and there's actually a way to search it. So if you say, if you search Google with QuickBooks Pro Certified, uh, Pro Certified Pro Advisor, you're going to find people around you know very specific topics, and you can see I did a snapshot of Boise, Idaho, where I'm based, bookkeeping services, legal industry. But what you'll find is many of these folks check a box for legal and really don't know legal. So Lean Law created a, something called the Lean Law Accounting Pro Program, where we went out and actually developed relationships with those QuickBook Pro advisors, but they knew three things, Lean Law, Law, and QuickBooks Online. So here's an example of a pro advisor, and this is Linda Artizani. She's a 25-year bookkeeper who focuses entirely on law, and this is her page inside of Lean Law. So we've actually, and Linda and I are good friends, and we've become friends through the pro program, I've said, hey, Linda, here's a client of Lean Laws, you need to go help them. And she's gone in and dramatically been that person that helped them evolve that accounting architecture. So what should you expect from your accounting pro? Professionalism. They should be as sophisticated as you are, or at least close. Um, legal invoicing know-how, some, they don't need to be experts, but they have to have some, some sense of it, especially if you get into contingency or hybrid billing. Um, certainly some understanding of trust accounting, um, you don't want to have to train them to do that. And they should know the tools of the trade. Um, you know, they should have some idea of what good invoicing tools are. And the fifth point is really important. They should help you create the best practices in your firm as you think about the life cycle of your money. Lastly, or not lastly, but um, when we think about what value they add, if we look at this chart, the functional or commoditized value is this workflow. And that, a good workflow, meaning a good process, produces quality data. If we get good data, we can get insights. And if we get insights, that can have a direct effect on your efficiency and your profitability. But if you have a bad workflow, everything north of that will fail. You won't get good data, you won't get insights, and you'll actually affect your, your efficiency and profitability. So some questions to ask, and um, I just want to be conscientious of time. The really important thing on this slide to ask is really talking about the steps of your invoicing and explaining that process to them so they can understand and adopt to it, but also asking them what's their process for onboarding and working with clients because there has to be a, a, a meld between your two entities. Um, in summary, you've got to know um, your tools need to be in the cloud. 
Lean Law QuickBooks Online. You've got to know what you're looking for. Um, you want to make sure that your accountant understands law and QuickBooks. Um, you want to be clear with your expectations and what you're purchasing, and you want to make sure you get the workflows right. Um, okay, back to you, Maddie. All right, well, a lot of really fantastic information there, and I have, as Jonathan told me, way too many slides, so here's what we're gonna do. I'm going to give you kind of the highlights, and then you will be able to review these slides on your own time, and you can email me at the end with any questions that you have about topics you wanna dig in further. But basically, what I wanna start off with, um, even before you, I'm, I'm clicking my arrows as if I'm controlling the screen, but next slide, please, Jonathan. Um, what I want to start off with is just like getting the lay of the land for before you're doing all those billing tasks, like where are these people coming from who are interested in hiring you potentially? How do you determine if they're a good potential fit? Um, and, and then what happens when you do get like a live one on the line, you know, are they ready to commit immediately? If so, you know, you do the intake and you get the client. If not, you sort of like follow up with them and follow up until you determine are they going to hire you or not on the bottom side of the line also like if they're not good potential clients and you determine that at the outset do you refer them out to other firms because one way to have another um, opportunity for business growth is to have a really strong referral policy and I don't mean necessarily making money directly off of those referrals and you need to be careful with that there is a slide later about that but actually building goodwill in the community um, by referring out business that you don't necessarily want and that can be for a law firm or accounting practice or uh, whatever the case may be and and then building the education in your community also about what you do. So before you hang up with someone and say, nope, that's not my practice area, take a moment to actually educate them so that they know in the future if they have a need that your firm might be a good fit. So these are the ways that people uh, find out about you in terms of the generation of new clients, how they contact you, meaning how they interrupt you, and then who is responding, so who's getting that interruption, and then is the interruption worthwhile or not for you to do business with this person? Are you going to try and win them over or are you um, going to refer them out for someone else to win them over? So totally understand if you have to go, by the way, we will continue the recording so you'll be able to tune in later. Next slide, Jonathan. Oops, sorry. Is that the right one? Yeah, uh, so go back one. Uh, sorry, yes, go go forward one. Uh, so, so one of the things uh, that you can do here is to limit calls and emails, um, and that can be through web chat and through texting. Um, but the most important thing is that you have people who are your front line of defense so that when you are running a lean practice, you are not being interrupted because that will reduce your productivity. And it's not necessarily the case that everyone needs to speak to you directly because A, you, you, you know, as soon as they think they're talking to a lawyer, they're getting legal advice. And it's nice to have a barrier to entry where the person can be qualified. And then if so, if it, they're worthy of that interruption and they're a good fit for your practice area, then you schedule time to actually talk to them, which is built into your day and you have the expectation that you're going to spend time with that person. Um, you can also charge for consultations in so, in, insofar as that fits your practice area. And one of the ways that people get around kind of the burden of that is to credit it to the first bill, um, which you can obviously incorporate into lien law um, so that you are taking that money and it's not an extra cost. It's just more of an indication that that person is serious about hiring you. Now with web chat, the nice thing is, is that you can be very responsive to people who are even referrals are going to go to your website and try and find out a little bit more about you, make sure that they're a good fit, um, find out the hours that you're going to answer your phones. And then this can stem the calls and emails by immediately having responsiveness and indicating clearly that any sort of chat that happens on your website is not establishing an attorney-client relationship. It is not legal advice. Um, and with that understanding, they can go through and they can chat either with you directly if you want to or someone on your staff. You can actually man these yourself, so to speak. Um, or you can have receptionists uh, like Smith AI staff it for you 
the nice thing is, is that a lot of the software, including ours, has automated responses available. So again, improving the consistency of the response, whether it's through calls or email, to make sure that the same message is delivered every time. Um, if you have an online calendar or if you have like an online payment link, for example, um, you may post those on your website. What you can also do is you can have the chat be sort of a gatekeeper for that. So again, protecting your time. Sometimes what we find is that if you have a calendar on your website, people will book time with you just because you give them the option to, rather than having that vetting or basic intake process in place first, what chat can do is connect someone with a live receptionist, have that conversation take place. Oh, you're looking for uh, help with the child custody case. Like, do you currently have a divorce? Uh, in process if so then yes i take the child custody case if not actually no i'm going to refer you to the bar's lawyer referral service like th these things happen all the time where there's certain parameters for the clients who you will work with and who you prefer not to work with someone can do that filtering on your behalf and then once the screening happens then that person who is staffing chat can actually provide the link to the calendar or even have the dialogue back and forth that says the next available appointment is at 2 p.m what's the best number to reach you, what's your email, and they actually get a link to that calendar appointment invite in their email and you know the person's gonna show up. Um, so again, that's just one way to kind of like streamline communications and be responsive without the onus being on you. Next slide. So one of the other things is that you can add a lot of the, the information that you keep up here Put it on your website, have a permanent place for it. It doesn't need to be a blog post. It doesn't need to be a big diatribe necessarily. But what we're seeing more and more is that solo and small firm attorneys are building out knowledge bases with tools like help docs and things like that, where it's not an FAQ, it's not a blog post, it's actually a dedicated place on your site that has in-depth information about how you work, maybe it's also your billing practices, when you can expect to receive invoices, when your first invoice comes through, what is trust accounting and how does it relate to how you're going to operate with your practice. Um, what clients can expect, that's not necessarily a blog post, it's not necessarily a one online FAQ that you have on your website, um, it may be more substantial. And the nice thing is, is that whether you're writing emails or you're communicating or your front staff needs to say the same message every time, they can refer to this knowledge base and it can also be linked to through your email, through your web chat, on your Facebook page to help stem again those calls and emails. Next slide. So texting, uh, I talk to a lot of attorneys who are hemming and hawing about whether or not they want to be texting. I'll tell you, like, if you're not receiving texts from your clients, it's probably because your phone is not text enabled. I just talked to a client the other day who said, I didn't think my clients were bothering to text me. And then I switched to a different VOIP phone service, the internet phone service, and, and realized that she was getting many text messages. They just weren't coming through. So enable that. You can use it with your landline if you choose a service like ZipWhip. And the nice thing is, is that these services, you really get what you pay for. So you can automate responses so that you're not necessarily having to respond individually, manually every single time. But if someone says something like, can I schedule an appointment? You could say, yes, we're taking new appointments for, you know, these types of cases right now, or please answer these questions first, and then we'll determine, you know, if our firm is right for you. You can receive images that then can be passed through integrations into your case management uh, software. For example, this photo here of the car crash um, and logged in real time. So text messages are also great for folks who don't have printers and they need to take a screen, like a, a photo of a document that they have signed, for example. So things like that when they're on their phone, if you have an app like Dropbox or something, you can immediately drop that um, image or file into that Dropbox folder that's secure. A lot of these integrations are very affordable and they also allow you to have instantaneous like 
uh, logging so that it doesn't have to be the case that someone texts you a photo, you email it to yourself, and when you get back on your computer, you, you pull it into the right file, um, into the right uh, software. It can be done on an automated basis. The nice thing is for the clients is that you demonstrate that responsiveness to them, and responsiveness is just not a matter of time. It's also a matter of being on the channels where your clients prefer to communicate with you. So opening up text messaging allows you to meet their preferences where they are in their lives. They're not necessarily going to have a different communication channel for you. They use you know, text messaging for their roofer, their accountant, their whoever, they expect it from their lawyer as well. And that's what we find. Now, from a billing perspective, one of the nice things is that you can also log your time spent texting and you can pass that information um, into your systems of record so that you are, if you're interacting with clients, on text message, you should and deserve to get paid for that time. So keep that in mind that there are apps available for that as well. Um, Timeliner is one of them, but there are others available. I think, you know, I'll leave that up to you. Um, next slide. So uh, when we talk about processes, you know, Jonathan talked a lot about workflows and I'm very much of this mindset as well. Um, so understanding that we are at the hour mark, I'm going to move very quickly through this content, which is basically standardize your intake process and how you filter out leads and then make sure that you stick to it and you hand off as much of this as possible so that you are filtering consistently and also doing exit interviews to reinform this process as a cycle so that you get better over time filtering out people who you didn't catch early on. This just goes into more details about how many questions, about five to 10, are you gonna charge for it or not? And then different creative intake forms. So are you gathering information by providing a service? For example, in Chicago, there is an eviction notice uh, that Tri-City Legal provides that basically gives them a completed eviction notice form when they complete this on their website. It's totally free. It gets emailed to them in completion with directions for how to file it for landlords who need to evict a tenant. The beautiful thing is that they find out all the data they need to file follow up effectively with this lead, then then ask them up for a five day notice after four days, for example, do you need help with that tenant matter that you're dealing with? So how can you have informed follow up so that you can be only focusing your energy on the, the potential clients who are of you know, most likelihood to hire you? Next slide. Again, appointment scheduling, I talked a little bit about this. If you already are using Outlook or iCalendar, Google Calendar, there's a free tool called Calendly that will allow you to actually share your calendar, only adding access, not allowing people to edit or remove appointments from your calendar, which is important for the professional rules of conduct that you're not giving people more information than they should have who are working on your behalf in an outsourced manner. Um, these people can, for a receptionist, for example, um, book appointments, callbacks, et cetera, on your calendar. They can see when you're free if someone is trying to reach you. And then the appointment is made and it blocks off that time for you and also for the person with whom you're meeting. Next slide. Here's an example. Acuity is another program. It allows for multiple appointment types and also form completion can be done with type form or gravity form so that you have information before the appointment even happens. And that can be done with an intake specialist or receptionist um, so that that information is in your case or practice management system before the appointment itself. And if you have chat transcripts, those can be added as well so we can see the entire dialogue um, with that potential client. Next slide. Now, consistently collecting payments. One of the things that I will say here, and I, you know, Jonathan, this really gets at um, having not just a lean model, but also a model that provides comfort to your clients. So if you have an existing relationship with uh, your clients, it's often, you know, 
friendly. It's even familial to some extent. And people do not like talking about finances. It's a really uncomfortable matter. And if you have people who you have a good relationship with otherwise, but they're not paying their bills, one of the best ways to use a receptionist service is actually on an outbound manner to have them call people who are consistently late on their payments or currently late on their payments and have a neutral third party to follow up on their billing so that they can have that payment made and hopefully via credit card again so the onus of collection is not on you but on the credit card company um but having that neutral third party allows you to hand off that uncomfortable conversation and preserve that personal relationship with your clients next slide so i talked a little bit about uh referrals and again it's really important that your referrals are coming in uh, to you from members of the community and you are putting them out there so that you're not necessarily taking any cases that you really prefer not to work on because there's an opportunity cost for your time. So every time you take on a new client, that means that that time is reserved and it's not available to another potential client. So be as conservative as you need to be based on your growth objectives. If you're starting a new firm, you're probably much more likely to take on you know, a lot more clients and you're not gonna be referring as much out. If you're in a more mature practice, as in you know, you've been around a lot longer and maybe you have uh, an idea for the, the ideal clients and you can winnow them down, then refer out as much as possible and make sure that people know that you're referring out to them so that you can ask you know, politely, well, well, if you find cases that are not good for you, um, please refer them to me or have that dialogue and say, are there cases that you're hearing about? And, oh, you know, I'm raising my hand. That's something that actually I would be happy to, to be referred to for. Next slide. Um, so I'm going to skip over this in terms of integrations. There's a lot of API integrations that are available for improving the efficiency. Um, you can view this, you know, on your own time in terms of tracking metrics and having a data-driven approach to your efficiency. Um, but I want to get into the game plan really quickly. So let's review that next slide, which is really tracking your billable time for a week. Uh, next slide, Jonathan. And um, identifying the non-billable work as what your next action is going to be. So are you going to continue doing it yourself? Because um, it's really something only you can do. Only you can show up at that happy hour for lawyers. You can't outsource that, right? But what can you streamline, automate, and outsource that does not require your direct involvement, or at least initially? And then how do you prioritize fixing and, and taking action with these op opportunities that you've identified? And what I use here is the Eisenhower decision matrix um, to basically indicate what has the greatest importance and urgency that is going to be your greatest focus early on. So scheduling and payments are most often the time consuming, and most time consuming and most easily outsourced, whereas data entry and lead follow-up are things that you can automate with API integrations, with tools like Zapier that allow you to connect your software and systems in an automatic way where one action in one system triggers another action in another system. Wait to you know, take on like one to two of these projects at a time, implement them, maybe it's a top three, and then do it within 30 to 60 days. And then, and this is really important, allow things to stabilize so that you have enough data you can capture on the actual effect of these processes. Assess the impact, not just quanti quantitatively, you know, how much revenue did this bring in? How much time did it save you? Um, how much more efficient are your processes? But also, what is your work-life balance, your stress levels, your sleep quality, etc.? It's both quantitative and qualitative impacts that we're looking at. And then I just wanted to you know, draw your attention to our complementary services. Um, Jonathan, you can kind of scroll through the slides as I mentioned them, um, that there is a keypad cloud phone system. So if you're using your personal cell phone, I really encourage you not to do so. When someone has your cell phone, they will not take it out of their phone. It's kind of in there for good. So give them a business number from the outset. You can use that number with the app on your cell phone. So same device for you, different display number and different filtering for your clients, which gives you, again, more control. You can also block spam numbers, which is really helpful for reducing interruptions. 
and not spending your time on things that consume it preciously. Um, so, you know, it works mobile browser. Uh, you can see the calls that are missed. You can easily like listen to voicemails and you can text from within there as well. And you can have the appropriate caller ID show up on your client's phones, even though you're using your cell phone. And then web chat. So you can host this on your website um, and there is real-time English Spanish translation for Spanish speaking potential clients. It runs weekdays live with receptionists and after hours with the chat bot 24 seven so that you can be responsive to new and existing clients. And of course this integrates with any links that you have to your billing or your calendar. Um, you will also see the chat transcripts live within your system. Uh, so you're fully up to speed on the conversations that are happening about or with your firm. So that is Smith AI in a nutshell. Uh, we are here to be responsive on your behalf through both inbound and outbound calls, live website chat, and our keypad cloud phone system. And to get back to the lean motto, everything is month to month. So keep in mind that, you know, it's all based on your, um, your, pay for things that you are you are using and not paying for things in a lump sum no matter the usage that's kind of like the main takeaway that i would give for you today that like it's really important that you pay per instance per action whatever the case may be so that then it's much easier to draw it back to what is the return on that investment it's not just a dedicated time spent um, and money spent for variable results and usage. Um, you can use the code LEAN50 if you sign up for Smith AI. Uh, we will, we always start off with 10 calls or five chats free so that you and we can um, get to the best process and system together. And if you would like, you can sign up for Keypad, but we work with any phone system. So that's totally up to you. And uh, yeah, that, that's all she wrote, Jonathan. I think that I just wanted to draw attention to the ebook that we have available for download, um, that you can dig into a bit more of these practices and, and your workflows and roadmap for implementing uh, a lean firm. Um, it's easier than you may think. So um, we're, we're long and we apologize, but we really appreciate you taking the time to connect with us to to listen to us. Um, we'll make sure that everyone gets this deck as a follow-up. Um, and you have both Maddie and mine conversations. You have a Lean 50 um, you know, incentive for Maddie's and Lean Law has a, as Maddie said, that trial, a two week free trial to engage with Lean Law. So we encourage and welcome you to explore this and, and connect with us if we can be of, of assistance and guidance. So thank you all. Um, and I'm going to end the uh, webinar. Have a lovely weekend.